Sambhujasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Bhutam Dhammam Sankham Namasami Well, um, hello again, and welcome to those who are just joining us. Um, this um, w yesterday, I was speaking with Ayanianika, and uh, she had some ideas about something to speak about, but unfortunately, she's not able to come. But. Um, what was coming up was the idea of sada. This is a, a word that um, some of you might recognize. It's uh, translated um, often as faith or confidence or trust. Convic conviction, I think, is another. Um, way it's translated and I've also heard of teachers talking about the devotional aspect that it, it um, implies a certain amount of devotion and um, sada appears in uh, you know many of you who study Buddhism might notice that there's all these lists <laughs> it's a uh, four of this and five of that and seven of this and so on in the Buddhist teaching. And this is a, a, a wonderful method to help with memory. You first you rem memorize the, the lists and then you start to understand what each component in those lists uh, are and how they work together. And um, so sada appears, um, I think, most well-known in the um, five faculties. It's the first of the five faculties. And um, this is what actually gets us started on the path. If we're not born Buddhist and uh, we start hearing the Buddhist teaching, then a certain amount of trust or confidence or faith in the teaching arises through our understanding. And then we, um, the second faculty is energy. So then it, this arouses, it inspires our energy to start investigating and, and learning. Um, and th actually the fifth of the five faculties is wisdom. So we're starting on our path to develop the development of wisdom. And sada and panya, the wisdom faculty and the faith faculty or competence faculty, balance each other out. Because if we were just going on gullible faith, um, just because somebody said so. We're not investigating for ourselves, developing this wisdom for ourselves, knowing for ourselves, experiencing for ourselves. And then it's just maybe promises that no one can keep or some prove. You know, there's a certain kind of faiths where they, they promise you all kinds of things, but it can't, it can't be proven. But um, with the sada, it's not just belief. There's a certain amount of trust in that we might not fully realize or understand for ourselves, but there's enough that's apparent here and now in the Buddha's teaching that we can know, oh, this is true. This I can know for myself. This I can realize for myself. This I can understand how it works for myself. Um, so uh, I just, for, for the sake of complete 
Yes, I'm going to mention all five of the spiritual faculties because I did mention this list. But I'm going to work mostly with the idea of the sada, which is the faith faculty balancing the wisdom faculty. So there's um, sada, which is, as I translated, wiriya, which is usually translated as energy, and sati is usually translated as mindfulness, and samadhi has a lot of different <laughs> translations. I just, um, samadhi is translated as stillness or concentration or um, collectedness of mind. Uh, there's a number of translations and some people get very uh, emotional about how it's translated sometimes. But it is a spiritual faculty. And, um, and then, of course, panya, which is wisdom. Um, our devotion to our practice actually helps with the support of samadhi. You have to have that kind of devotion to your practice in order for your uh, meditation to deepen. And then the samadhi, the stillness of mind, the quietness of mind, the peacefulness of mind, allows the mind to be unbiased and to see things clearly as they are. And this is the support to the wisdom faculty. It allows the wisdom faculty to rise, that true knowing, that direct knowing to rise. So all, all of the five faculties, it's like kind of like a hand working together. So you have the, um, starting out with the, the sada on one end and the panya on the other end, touching one another, and the sama samadhi and wuriya balancing one another, the energy and the stillness balancing one another. You, if you don't have that wuriya, then the uh, samadhi could just get dull and it just uh, kind of be more like sleepiness or something dullness rather than clarity. And then the, the sati looks after all of it. The, the mindfulness uh, helps all of it work together. So it's, it is like a hand, these five faculties. Um, but the, but the sada will grow as our understanding grows, which is the part of the, the wisdom faculty. And um, if we start having doubt or uncertainty, then we need to employ the wisdom faculty. We start to investigate, oh, how, how is this? Is this true? Um, who can I speak to about this? How can how, this inquiring inquiring mind is um, really essential on the path? We're not just supposed to uh, take it because the guru said so. <laughs> the, uh, it says it's so in this scripture here, and that, therefore it is true. Uh, it's more, oh, what does it actually mean? What is it, what is it trying to tell me? What is this pointing to? And so we do this inquiry, this investigation for ourselves in order to increase our, both the sada and the panya. In the Kalama Sutta, the, uh, the Kalamas were confused because there were all these different ascetics and Brahmins and teachers coming through their village and they're saying uh, different things were absolutely true. You believe in what I have to say, this is the truth. And, and there were contradictory things that they were saying. So uh, it was perplexing. And the, the Buddha said, well, of course you're perplexed. 
this is a perplexing matter, all these people saying these different things and, and s claiming to be true. So how do you know for yourself? So he gave a, a structure for us um, that we should investigate on, um, actually he talked about the wholesome and unwholesome roots. And he said, what do you think, Kalamas, if, this, if you act out of greed, hate, and delusion, is that for your happiness? Is that for your benefit or is it for your harm and suffering? And of course they said, oh, that's for harm and suffering if we act out of greed, hate, and delusion. And, we're, and the, the Buddha said, yes, if you're likely to break. He speaks of four of the five precepts, which you didn't take today, but <laughs> hopefully you're keeping all five of them well. So, um, so a person, if they're acting out of greed, hate, and delusion, they're likely to kill, to steal, to um, transgress with somebody else's partner, their spouse or partner, and um, or lie or, sp or speak unkindly, that, uh, abuse speech. But, um, and that is for one's own harm and one's own, uh, he asks, well, what do you think? Is that for their, your, your benefit or harm? <laughs> or other people's benefit or harm if you break these precepts. And of course they said, well, of course it's for harm, you know, this is why. Uh, so we said that, that if, if someone is encouraging you to do any of these things or to uh, act out of greed, hate, and delusion, then uh, don't, don't follow those people. But he was giving them guidelines to, uh, for their to know for themselves that this is harmful, this is something to be avoided. And then um, there's the other side of it, if you act out of non-greed, non-hate, and non-delusion, is that for your happiness or for your benefit? Or for your harm and suffering? So of course he said, what's well, for our benefit and happiness and for the benefit and happiness of others. So he gave these really specific guidelines to know for yourself if we're on the right, right track, if this is helpful to us or if it's harmful. So he was encouraging them to investigate for themselves. And then um, not only that, it's, it's through body, speech, and mind. So he was encouraging them to uh, purify the mind as well. But he, he said, um, but he wasn't saying, just because I said so, but because if you're perplexed, you should think, is this gonna increase my own suffering or the suffering of others, what I'm doing? So internally, if we're having uh, unwholesome mental states, is that for our benefit or harm? <laughs> so, of course, it's not for our benefit. Uh, so we, we, ha we learn how to investigate. This is a, a called um, foundational right view to understand the wholesome and the unwholesome. And um, the, the foundation of a building is essential. So the foundation of the path to really understand the wholesome and the unwholesome um, is essential. And to see causation on a very fundamental level. If I, I see uh, the cause of suffering, or the uh, Four Noble Truths, if we deeply understand the Four Noble Truths, this is right view. So here he's talking about causes of suffering and causes of happiness. So we can see directly these things. So we have this foundation to build on 
to get into the, the deeper, subtle workings of causation. But at, at least if we have this foundation, then we can see the, the happiness increasing in our lives and we can say, oh, I can see the path. I can actually see the, if you start examining the Noble Eightfold Path and how it's leading to our happiness and decreasing the suffering. And um, this is a foundation for our practice on the cushion too. If we're keeping our sila well, this is getting um, getting around back around to sada. So we're developing wisdom by examining for ourselves what are the causes of suffering and what are the causes of happiness, and then um, looking at the four noble truths. There is dukkha and the cause of dukkha is the second one, and these two are apparent. So when I see how tanha, how greed is increasing my suffering and the absence of greed is decreasing the suffering, then I, 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 I could see that. Actually, when I first read The Four Noble Truths, I was in like in my 20s, and I thought, wow, this is really powerful. I knew, I just knew it. I knew it was right. I could see how greed was a, ca a cause of suffering. So that brought my sada <laughs> way up and then uh, encouraged me to um, pursue the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the fourth noble truth. Naroda, the cessation, is not so apparent, we're blinded to that still by ignorance. So as we develop the wisdom faculty, our faith is, our sada is going to increase because we'll be able to see that for ourselves. But the more um, we see for ourselves on the more foundational level, the more we're going to have the energy to continue on the path and to have that breakthrough. And you get to the point where there's the unshakable sada, the unshakable faith of a stream enterer. This is a one, it's another list here, but there's four qualities of a stream enterer, and this is unshakable faith in the Buddha, unshakable faith in the Dhamma, unshakable faith in the Sangha, and keeping the precepts pure. That's the four. So, <laughs> um, this wisdom faculty <clears throat> again balances the um, out the sada. So the sada isn't um, just kind of foolish or gullible or just based on uh, uh, there's another word for it, but I don't want to, I can't think of it right now. So it's like a, like a, the, the, the mindfulness is like a post and then the sada and the uh, panya are on either sides of the scale, of a, like if you have a balanced scale. And as the, as the, the sada is growing, the panya is growing, and they're always keeping in balance to one another. So I'm going to, let's see, okay, that's all right. So I'm just pausing for a minute. Sometimes uh,
I'm just assuming that most people know some of what I'm talking about, so it may need to have some questions, but um, so it's always good to question, and there's a proper way to question, and um, it's not a kind of skepticism that's uh, critical, but investigative to see if it's true. And um, it's always good to um, talk with other people and see if uh, your understanding is correct. And also using the guidelines of looking at whether there is uh, harm or benefit in the, in the way you're pursuing things, the way you're doing things. That, and, and that's the same with the mental states. And if you're seeing an increase of happiness in yourself and understanding, that's a really good uh, sign. It means progress on the path. Sada also uh, appears in the, uh, there's this long list that's uh, uh, called um, dependent liberation rather than, uh, rather than uh, the um, dependent origi origination. And it has dependent origination down to suffering. It's like you start out with ignorance and the uh, uh, volition and uh, the um, the name and form and and the sense bases and uh, down to uh, feeling and and uh, the desire that arises and the the clinging and the and the becoming and the birth and then sickness aging and death and then just crashes into the, the dukkha, boom, <laughs> right? And then there you are at the bottom of the, this cascade saying, oh, this really hurts. But then you go, oh, the B Buddha talked about dukkha. <laughs> this, is, this is actually something I need to understand. And then uh, when you start understanding the causes and, uh, of dukkha, then it's what happens is that sada arises. And then uh, joy, it's a pomoja, arises. And then that starts cascading upwards to liberation. Um, because of your, un there's just this point where, uh, there's a shift, because instead of being lost in the dukkha, you're starting to understand it. <laughs> you're using it as a tool to, for the path to liberation. And uh, so that's where the sada becomes the starting point towards liberation. And this is a, what I hope for all of you, that uh, we can all have a breakthrough to the path and uh, realize the cessation, the complete cessation of suffering and our li lives and minds will become liberated. So I'll offer this uh, for your reflection and open it up to uh, conversation. Han tamayang tamakata sa tu karang tatamase sa tu sa tu sa tu anumotami. Well, there we got a question right there. <laughs> Two questions. 
Thank you. So you said that uh, critical inquiry is important to developing right view. And I'm wondering um, how you recommend inquiring in the most effective way, because I often notice myself thinking about my problems throughout the day, and then I think to myself, well, I'm really trying to get to the bottom of this, but I feel like that's the opposite of mindfulness. I feel like I really need to compartmentalize or set aside a time to really like think deeply on something. So I'm wondering how you recommend really not getting carried away by trying to uh, understand your problems, but still like finding a time to do that. So um, you did say something about finding a time during the day. Um, that sounds like a, I mean, when you're busy during the day, involved in your activities, it's really not a good time to that. Um, but you can always have this question to yourself, is this helpful or is this harmful? So I'm doing something and I'm thinking about my problems and it's distracting me from what I'm doing. So I might say to myself, okay, this isn't helping me now. Or if I feel an emotion coming up, I'm feeling distressed or angry, I say to myself, is this going to help me or is this harmful? And then I say, okay, I can see this stress in my body. I can experience this stress in my body. And there's a little cues to see that the mind is get maybe speeding up or something. You're, so you're, there's awareness of what's going on. So this is actually a kind of investigation in itself. You're investigating, oh, what's going on now? How am I co causing myself suffering now? How am I release, releasing the suffering? How Can I see? Just investigating it sometimes helps. You say, oh, this is what's going on. Like a scientist, you know, in the field. You know, there's different kinds of sciences, but, you know, like uh, somebody who's studying wildlife and they're out in the field and they're observing the birds, but they also have to observe their own behavior. And if I'm really quiet and still and wait for a long time, I'm going to actually see this. So, so you kind of see, oh, right. how is it in my own experience that I'm causing suffering? How is it that I can... Um, let go of this. What is what is working for me? What is helping me? Um, and then if there there's like you're talking about problems in your life, um, according to the the Buddhist teaching, um, you can put it in some kind of framework work. Perhaps, I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but um, sometimes you think, I'm, what is it that I'm wanting? That's another question you can ask yourself. I want other people to behave the way I think they should. This is what I want. <laughs> so then, of course, I'm su going to suffer, right? Um, I want the world to be the way I think it should be. I want uh, the politicians to behave the way they should. And uh, <laughs> what else? Uh, I want the climate to be able to be the way I'd like it to be. So, um, so we're causing ourselves suffering by wanting something that's impossible for us to solve ourselves, like change ourselves. So how we approach things, how we interact with other people, this is what we can change. So um, so you have a, maybe you have a certain amount of choices, who you interact with and who you don't interact with, 
who you want to be uh, influenced by, um, or can I be a good influence on them? If I if I change if I'm always if I have, I'm compassionate, patient, loving, no matter how this other person is behaving, at least I'm taking care of this end, my own side of the street. This is like driving, you know, if I'm driving a car, I've got to be directing the car, and uh, I'm aware of others around me, and to prevent myself from crashing into them, right? So it's the same with human interactions. So you might have to steer out of the way of certain people because they're just too, too difficult to be around. But so you have to use your discernment here. What, uh, what, because I'm, I'm not sure what your issues are with, uh, I imagine it's often with the other people. <laughs> this is like the most common thing. Uh, if not, um, it could be, um, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but. Um, and then according to the Buddhist teaching, there's things like sickness, aging, and death, which are inevitable. And I was a nurse, so I know at any age, these sickness and aging, a uh, sickness and death can happen at any age. Disability can happen at any age. So we do the best to care for ourselves. So we, this is where the wisdom is, to care for ourselves um, psychologically and physically, to do, do our very best to care for ourselves. But then there's a limit to what we can do. So this is where we're using the wisdom factor is how, how, uh, how much can I actually do in this situation to care for it? And then we do our best, and then we let go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I really appreciated the way you used the image of the hand for the five faculties and how each faculty uh, related to another and there was balance. And I can understand how wisdom informs sada, it's sada, right, faith? But I forgot, you said it, how faith informs wisdom, how they go together. Okay, so that's, thank you very much for that question because that is um, something I didn't get into so much. So if you have wisdom and no faith, it would be more intellectual and it could be just very dry. And then also, um, if you're just doing a lot of inquiry and it, it's, you're not feeling that kind of inspiration coming up from it, then it, it may be, um, yeah, just too much on an intellectual level. So um, bringing some amount of inspiration into our lives like thinking about uh, the life of the Buddha or being inspired by individuals, uh, like uh, that, that can bring up joy and energy and, and that's what we, we would be called uh, kind of a bright brightness. There's a sada should be uh, bright and then also the devotion to what you're doing. It's out of, out of kind of a love for what you're, you're doing. If you're just going to be uh, kind of doggedly sitting on the cushion and doggedly reading the suttas and really trying to understand it all in an intellectual level, it could just get too dry and uh, cumbersome. But the, the sada brings the lightness and the, uh, the joy and the devotion. my side of the room, unfortunately. 
Thank you, Aya. Thanks for the talk today. I was, um, as you mentioned, you were a nurse before. Pardon me? You, you used to be a nurse before? A nurse. Nurse? I was a nurse, yes. Yeah, so, and also you talked about how the four qualities of person of a stream enter that they have unshakable faith and and all other three qualities. I was wondering, like, tell me about your, some of your maybe personal experience that um, at some point maybe in your journey you had a question about the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha and how how did you get beyond that? How how from that doubt or question or challenge you came through? Like from y what did you do at that point? Did that make sense? Oh, um, thank you. Yes, um, I think uh, I had a difficult time because of people actually. And I lost, I did, it's true. And um, I was with a, um, I was in a different form of Buddhism. And uh, the people were kind of behaving not so well. And I was very hurt by some people. And um, I realized I just kind of went away from the practice uh, for some time because of the community I was with was not nurturing to me. But I didn't completely lose the faith, the sada. And so, but I kind of got off track for quite some time. And then um, actually, um, encountered uh, it was a Vipassana group, and I started reading the teachings of the Buddha because of the, for, uh, the tradition that I was um, in previously, they didn't talk so much about the, uh, the suttas or the direct teachings of the Buddha, and that really sparked my faith again. And then I, I met uh, the uh, monastics at Abhayagiri <laughs> Monastery, <laughs> and, and that really inspired me. So it was a uh, between, uh, but yeah, I was, I was pretty lost for quite some time, even though I started meditating quite early in my life. Um, but I, it was a disappointment in people's behavior because they weren't keeping their sila. And it was just kind of the nature of the 70s. I hate to say. <laughs> so, uh, and not to say I was completely innocent either. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I could see directly how not keeping sila is harmful. Yeah, and so... Um, Fortunately, I did find others that were keeping sila well. I was so happy to meet the Abhayagiri monks because, uh, uh, partially because uh, the sila and then also the, the teaching was so powerful. So um, I think there are people that, that, that uh, hit some kind of a... a, a a block or a wall in their practice. And so sometimes it's just um, we can get re-inspired by other people or by uh, teachings. And I, sometimes when I've been having a hard time, I listen to Ajahn Brahms. Uh, I think it's his Friday night talks where he gets, you know, he, <laughs> he, he starts telling you all these kind of corny jokes and stuff. and it, he gets you all relaxed and happy, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, he hits you with this really powerful dhamma, and it's like, wow. <laughs> he's, I, figured, I figured out what he's doing, actually. <laughs> he gets you all relaxed and happy, and then suddenly, <laughs> he gets some really deep dhamma. It's like, poof, it's like, <laughs> he hits you without knowing. <laughs> anyway, 
So uh, that's that's my trick. If if ever if you're feeling depressed or something like that, <laughs> listen to a, a talk by somebody uh, that's really inspiring to you. Um, I also um, things getting dry. I sometimes just even open up the suttas, and it's surprising to me how they just speak to me. That's me. I know everybody's got their own method, but I think other people are, you know, the people on the path is a really, having this community here is so valuable. Yeah. And, and teachers that, that you, that really nourish your practice. I have a question for you. And out of that moment of joviality, this one might call for some really heavy dhamma. And I should probably ask you individually, but I think other people probably share some of this, and so it might be useful to ask it in this way. I come from a very deep immersion in spirituality. Um, I was, my whole world was entirely made up that way in my own mind. And I left that. And I come here with a very, very deep faith in the effectiveness of this practice. But it's as a psychology and as a sociology, I don't carry a faith in it as a religion. As a, as a religion. And when I heard you during your presentation talk about um, faith I started thinking about this, and I'm wondering, given this kind of way that I come to it as a, not an atheist, but an agnostic, with no expectation of adopting this as a religion, how do you respond to that? What does that say, what does that prompt you to want us to hear for those of us who come from this kind of a posture? without any expectation of becoming religious, but who knows? I think that's marvelous, actually. <laughs> I mean, um, there's a, like, it's a gradual path, and everything, like, the sada grows, and the fact that you're coming regularly and and have that curiosity and investigating for yourself, this, this is what the Buddha actually encourages. He was saying, not just because the guru says so. So investigate for yourself um, the teachings. So um, there is the intellectual understanding. It's kind of is the grid work. A certain amount of understanding needs to be there of what the Buddha is actually trying to teach us. But it's like a map in a way, or a grid work, or you know, like what is it, um, a blueprint or something like that. You can't, or the I think it's Ajahn Brahm talks about the if you go in a restaurant and somebody puts a menu in front of you and you eat the menu, <laughs> you're not gonna get you're not gonna get the nur nourish nourishment. But you you look at the menu and you go, okay, this is off my diet. This is actually what's going to be healthy for me here right now. And so that, that's what I'm going to nourish myself with. <laughs> so, or the blueprint is like, okay, this is, this is how we're supposed to proceed with putting up this building. And it's, it, it's not so cut and dry because uh, we're talking about life, which... <laughs> um, the Buddha is encouraging us to understand and to cutting, be able to cut through ignorance, which is a big challenge because ignorance, there's some comfort in that ignorance. Otherwise, we wouldn't be st staying in that. So um, that inquiry and just saying, well, this could be true or not. Let me, let me see. But the fact that you keep coming back and 
uh, inquiring and seeing, testing, if you're testing for yourself, is this actually helping? Is this actually, with my mind becoming less rigid? Is my heart opening more? Am I ha a happier person? And then, and then the people in my environment, I mean, I'm seeing very kind and generous and, you know, dedicated people. Uh, so I think, I don't know if that's answering your question, but um, yeah. And that, that spark, that spark of sada is what keeps people going. And if we keep nourishing that and uh, doing things that help increase, and then that investigation and learning and testing for ourselves, uh, I get really excited. I, it's a kind of a funny thing for probably most of the world that someone gets so excited about just reading the suttas. <laughs> a lot of people are, uh, I don't know what they're doing, snowboarding or something like that. <laughs> Surfing, I don't know what they do. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, and, and then your interest is is uh, is a, a a nurturance to your path that you're you do want to know you're you're looking into it deeply, and then there's the ability to be able to let go of that intellectual aspect of the mind. That's the scary part. <laughs> But that's where we have to have a leap of faith. <laughs> it's to really to be able to let go that much. So I think someone's looking at a clock and we have... Someone has a very short question, quick question. We can have one more question. Otherwise, I don't see any short questions. Any, t any tall questions? Short questions, tall questions. Uh, with that... Uh, I want to thank Aya Suvijana again, and very grateful, venerable for your um, talk today and for coming up from Olympia to, um, to visit us. And anyone who would like to support the new Posadi Vihara can give money to Juanita who will, uh, can give money to, can make donations, that's a little crude the way I expressed it there, can just hand over some cash to, <laughs> to Juanita. But Juanita, the, the, the monastics cannot handle money, so, and Juanita is giving them a ride. Juanita and Jeff are giving um, uh, Aya a ride, so you can leave your donations with Juanita, if I'm saying that a little bit more appropriately now. Um, and we'd like to thank you one more time with three sparkly sadhus. Ready? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu to all of you, too. Um, and right now, we'd like to introduce the chanting request list, which will start.